I'm Josh Liston from On The Bubble Podcast, an oral history of television fandom, part of the Gunner Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other awesome geeky shows at GunnerGeekNetwork.com. This is the official GunnerGeek.com show. Here we run down the latest news and happenings in the world of geek. These are your hosts for the show, Steven, Chris, and SP. Welcome to an all new episode of the official Gonna Geek Show. This is your April 2024 edition. I am Steven, and we're recording this on the 15th of April, which I believe is tax day in America. That's why I have my tax write off t shirt on just to support the cause. Also got Chris Farrell. Hi, welcome to one of the worst days in the world for some people. Thankfully, Taxman doesn't hate me this year. And also, he does hate Chris. SP's here. This is the day I enter into indentured servitude. I'm just joking, by the way. SP does not hate Chris. He hates me. There's a difference. Yeah, it's called a hair, hairline. Standard. I mean, everybody knows. That's, I didn't qualify. Who needs to qualify? Well, I think the difference is the fact that I'm Canadian and he is American. And I know that you hate all Canadians, SP. I do because <laughs> of your stupid loonies and your Molson and your maple syrup and, you know, Canadian bacon. Yeah. Well, I can understand that. I, I can understand that. We've got a lot of terrible things going on up here. But uh, you know what? It's it's April, which usually means it's still a little cool up here. But I don't know. It's feeling, feeling a little warm up in my area lately. I don't know why. It's just starting to feel a little bit hot here today. Is it so, fire season already? It, it It's not fire season yet, but oh, oh it, there's fire on my frame. What's going on there? I've got fire behind me. I, I think it's, his pants are on fire because he's been on lying. Fire. It's crazy. It's nuts. Oh, you know what I think's actually happened? I think are we in an episode of better podcasting. <laughs> it close because I think I think I've actually uh, finally gone to hell. I think that that's that's uh, where I, I am see. now. No. Oh reasonable yeah it's taken you this long to recognize that after you had kids <laughs> i was thinking more after i started doing this podcast but uh finally here in hell but uh you know what i have a feeling that it, it's gonna get a little bit colder wait 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 a minute hold on it's it is getting colder in here why is it getting colder there's snow behind me now it's bizarre is that because elsa is uh doing her magic i assume steven's about to say something nice about apple so hell froze over Hell did freeze over. And do you know uh, why hell froze over? I think you're about to tell us. You're right on the money, Chris, because tonight I'm on a Mac. What? What? Wow. I know. It's nuts. I decided. Did, did you do this on purpose? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so for those of you who didn't know this, uh, you might have, if you don't follow the Better Podcasting Show, uh, I've, I've been having some issues over the last little while with the heat production of my main machine with modern hardware. And a lot of times I'm not podcasting. It's just sitting there doing whatever. And uh, also my son likes the game and stuff. So, uh, you know, got to have the gaming machine. But I've been trying to, to find a solution to have like a, a, a regular rig that isn't putting off a ton of heat for most of my opportunity. And um at the moment, I, I thought Mac might be the way to go because the processor in there and the way that it is uh, so much cooler and it actually can do quite a bit. And so I, I will, full disclosure, I got it from Costco because I'm not still sure it's going to be the right workflow. And Costco has a much more liberal return policy than anywhere else. But um, I did end up uh, ordering one. And so I thought, let's see if, if I could do the show on on it tonight and see what happens. And so far, it seems to be performing OK. So we will find out. But yes, hell did freeze over, which is why I had to have a, 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 so, a different backdrop for tonight. So point of clarification. What kind of Mac are you on? Uh, it is a M2 Pro. Ooh. 16 gigs of RAM. I've already formed some opinions, which include of the Mac and the Mac users who like to tout certain wave big flags about all sorts of things like low RAM 
and um, it just working and stuff. Uh, I will reserve those for a more informed opinion. But at the moment, I, I have judged several people. So I think that I set a trend for Steven <laughs> here, because if you guys remember, dear listeners of the Gunna Geek show, it was probably six to nine months ago when one Chris Farrell said he was starting his Mac experiment for podcasting. I'd been using an M1 MacBook Air for a while and enjoyed it. And then I transitioned over to an M1 Mac Mini with 16 gigs of storage, 512, excuse me, 16 gigs of RAM, 512 gigs of storage. I think that I lit a fire under Steven. <laughs> now he had to, he had to come join me on the dark side of the force. Well, we'll see. I, I will admit. So it, SP has not commented, but last week while we were recording Better Podcasting, I told SP I was waiting for a package. So th that was this arriving. And I did oh edit my. last week's uh, uh, Better Podcasting on the Mac. And I will say this, that uh, because I switched to DaVinci Resolve, the uh, transition process, yeah, it looks like project files will go back and forth seamlessly. You just have to remap the media. So that kudos to DaVinci Resolve on that. So I was able to grab my other project files, pull them in. I did have some other things, which I'll, I'll save for a future discussion I, with, you know, compatibility with VSTs and stuff. But um, anyways, uh, so we'll see. We will see. Like I said, I specifically got it from Costco because I'm not 100% sold. But also part of me is just thinking with my workflow. Um, I, I'm not going to lie. I, I might need to find a way that my son can game more because, you know, I, I, I want to encourage the gaming. I got to encourage this, especially because he's gravitated to PC gaming. So I kind of want to let him use my machine a little bit more. So we'll see. That's fair. We'll no, see. I get it. We'll the, see. One question I have for you, and then I will stop asking questions about it. Okay. When you uh, when you did your rendering for better podcasting video in yes. DaVinci, you were using the M1 native app, I assume? Uh, I was using whatever was marked as compatible for okay. DaVinci. Okay, so Resolve. that would yeah. be the M1 name. Did you notice a faster rendering time? I haven't checked because I had okay. to, in part of just to get into the weeds a little bit, I did have to change some VST plugins because of the compatibility. So I'm actually planning to go in and grab that project file, throw it onto the PC, and re-render it and, and compare times at that point. Before Th that's I where I'd be really curious because yeah. you have an M2 Pro, which means you're going to have a better processor than I do. And while I haven't done anything complex, I've found that doing my transcoding and rendering for a 1080p video is an hour long, two hour long video, minutes, minutes, like 10 minutes or less in most cases. And that's just using iMovie and a little bit of playing around with DaVinci Resolve. And I've noticed some efficiencies there. Well, I'm not going to lie. If I was to keep this as my main machine, I have questions about whether I would want to keep this specific unit or pay to upgrade the RAM. Now, I don't know that my use case is going to be continuing to podcast on this or I would use the other machine. But, you know, yes, I have not hit above 85% of the 16 uh, gigabytes, but I do feel like there are some limitation things happening and some weird sure. quirks that I've seen that I think is related to throttling RAM usage. But um, anyways, we'll see. W we will see. It is a very much an experiment right now. And, I'm very excited for you. And we'll see. But I, I have to give, you know, credit where credit's due. Pretty powerful machine, uh, pretty capable machine for the, the footprint. So I, I got to give credit there. SP, I will now turn so you can flog me. Go ahead. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm going to flog you because two and a half years ago, <laughs> when I got it. my new machine, you said, no, no, you need to get that <laughs> new Windows-based machine. Do not go over to the Mac side of things. I stand you... by it because I knew you'd bring it up. If you go back and you look at the conversations, I said with your workflow, and we were talking about your portable, your laptop and stuff, and I was saying that if you're using a Windows-based editor, it it doesn't make sense to have a portable, incompatible workflow. And and so if you, unless you're on Resolve, I think if you were taking your laptop anywhere, you would run into this issue where now you can't edit because you're using uh, Vegas, which is Windows only. So I could have. So, Easily flipped over to Da Vinci back then. Not to mention, <laughs> I will say this. I will say this that I think the uh, the M1, as as Chris proved, I think the you know on the show here, I think the M1 was a, a a reset for how people might consider the Mac. Uh, I don't. I still struggle to see where the pre M series Macs were better than the comparable uh, Windows product. I I don't. I don't see it because. 
I think you were a direct apples to apples, Intel to Intel machine. I think you had a lot more other than the software. I think you had a lot better case to be made of going with a custom build for the price and everything. But now the M machines, I think, are they, they have their own unique offering. And I, I've admitted that on here. I've said that before, that the M processors definitely uh, change things a little bit. But I also think I've already experienced some things that um, I question some compatibility. I have already spent $10 on an app that doesn't seem to be working right. So um, we'll see. You can probably return that, though, we'll depending. See. I don't but, remember return policies. Uh, maybe I'll have to check that out. Um, it was an ID3 tag by, app, by the way. I still can't find I had to tag on Windows. <laughs> The M1 chip was out when I was mm -hmm. doing the, the switch over. Well, you can go relook at those chats because I remember we were talking about your possibility of a, of a laptop. Yeah, I know. I don't see it. It's exactly what Chris did. I think it could have been very. And uh, OK, so but Steven, anyways, vlog, continue. a question. Vlog. Question. Do you want to build a snowman? <laughs> <laughs> oh, for the audio listener, Chris is holding up the uh the i think it's his macbook air it's my m1 macbook air with my pretty d band d brand uh dragon skin on it i have to say i did consider there was a, a decent deal on a um macbook pro um but if i'm using this the goal is to have my monitor still because it's my day-to-day -day machine and this is already a compromise of one monitor i can only output three monitors which is one less than i usually was day-to-day -day. so uh, I can get around it if I'm not doing something HTTP compliant. I could use an, a dock or whatever, but um, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. It could be a big failure. Time will tell. And uh, SP, feel free to keep flogging. Go ahead. Oh, I I won't have to mention a thing. I will just <laughs> glare into the camp. I appreciate it. So hell froze over. Uh, okay, perfect. And if you would like... To hear me talk more about this, uh, come on to the Discord server because I know for sure I already disagree with some some common thoughts that are out there. All right, let's kick off the news this week with Chris talking about Fallout, and it might be the fallout of this podcast. From me using a Mac. <laughs> it very well could be. Yeah, we're going to talk about Fallout real briefly. I, I, I don't mean to swerve, but we're going to talk about the show, but not directly the show. So initial thoughts, I'll say this. The show is really good. I've only watched the first episode and a half out of, I think, the eight they dropped on Amazon Prime video. But I really have enjoyed it so far. But I'm also a uh, simp for Walton Goggins because I think he's amazing. So I'm looking forward to seeing more of this show. I've heard it ends on a very good note. Also promising some additional tie-ins into Fallout lore. But why are we talking about Fallout? Well, yes, the show is out on Prime Video. It's gotten good reviews. But more interestingly, it's always fun when we look at video game or comic properties and look and see how a series coming out impacts their sales or people's interest in it. And what's been interesting here is the uptick in the number of players playing a variety of different Fallout games, including Fallout 4, which by all accounts is one of the very best Fallout games in many people's cases. So let's look at some Steam metrics here. And this is an article I got, I believe, from Polygon.com that I'm referencing here. Fallout 1 in particular has been really interesting to look at on Steam metrics. This weekend, there were 2,300 players on Steam. Now, 2,300 players on Steam, not necessarily a big deal until we realized this is a 553.3% jump in concurrent players over the past month, according to SteamDB. So there's a lot of people that watched the show and then decided to pick up the first game in the series, probably because all the Fallout games are on sale right now on whatever digital storefronts you can pick them up on. Fallout 3 Game of the Year Edition saw a similar jump with around 6,700 concurrent players hopping up over the weekend to have a 415.4% increase over the past 30 days. Uh, Steam Charts also confirms the, the success of both, adding that even the base Fallout 3 saw a big jump. Finally, there's Fallout New Vegas, which is a game that many people love in the Fallout series, developed by Obsidian Entertainment, but not Bethesda. 
people were playing, excuse me, there were over 19,000 players in the days following the show's release playing at one time. Meanwhile, Fallout 76, which is a game that was in MMO that came out on X, all the consoles and PC back in 2015, kind of got panned. It's a game that I was very interested in because for those unaware, Fallout 76 takes place in West Virginia. You can actually go on my college campus that is in this post-apocalyptic world, which is kind of fun. It reached its all-time peak on Steam over the weekend with over 39,000 concurrent players. Now, no one else has really shown what those numbers look like on other platforms, but one thing to keep in mind is all of these Fallout games, they're on Game Pass if you're an Xbox or a if you're an Xbox Game Pass or PC Game Pass subscriber, and they have been on sale in the PlayStation Marketplace. And in fact, this last week, they dropped the next-gen upgrade for both Xbox Series consoles and PS5 consoles for Fallout 4. So it seems that Bethesda slash Microsoft kind of timed things right here, knowing that, hey, with the series coming out, all eight episodes, because it's not a week-to-week -week release, and we can get into an argument later about whether that's a good idea or not, has added a renewed interest to the Fallout franchise, including a game that was kind of beleaguered in fan opinions in Fallout 76. Now, I will say it came out in 2015. We've had a variety of patches and updates and DLC that have come out for it. A lot of folks who may have only played it when it first came out and been disappointed might find themselves revisiting it now and finding themselves having a more fun experience. So if you're a Game Pass subscriber, there's no reason not to fire it up and check it out. And if you can catch it on sale, and I think it's been on sale for dirt cheap in the Steam store, it might be worth checking out that or some of the other Fallout games because they're all on sale right now to coincide with the release of the series. Okay, so I, I hear what you're saying. I, I'm picking up what you're putting down. You're focused on the games and the gameplay and the game sales. I've got another avenue that needs to be explored here, and I'm serious about this. What is the increase in watching YouTube playthroughs of mm. Fallout? So that's probably a good question. And honestly, as more people who have never played a Fallout game before may pick one up, I'm sure they'll start looking through YouTube or going to GameFAQs. God, I'm dating myself with a GameFAQs <laughs> reference there. Or other websites that do walkthroughs for the Fallout games. Because remember, we're talking about Fallout 3, Fallout New Vegas. Those are games that are 10 plus years old, I want to say, at this point in time. So... While there's probably some Let's Plays on YouTube, the more, the better way, I guess, to get that content is probably an old written guides that people did online. Now, that might mean there's an opening now for a bunch of folks to come in and do a bunch of, for lack of a better term, retro Fallout inspired uh, videos and content. Well, I think if history repeats itself, if I remember correctly, um, The Last of Us had a big uh, resurgence with people paying old versions and whatnot online. So now, obviously, the story, my understanding, I've never played the game, but my understanding is the TV show was like a lift of the game. Um, so a little bit different here. But I, I think, though, you bring up a good point, SP. It probably, probably will spark an increase. But I'm wondering if people are watching the series or watch the series, because as you pointed out, every episode in the first season is out right now. And I do want to talk about that. But now that you have that out and people are watching that, and I think the vast majority of people, I've, I heard this statistic over the weekend, the vast majority of people are watching stuff on their phone. They're not watching it on TVs. They're not watching it on their computers. They're watching it on their phone. I don't know where on, in class, at work, on the bus, in the subway. I don't know, but they're watching stuff and consuming it on the phone. You can't play a game on your phone as well <laughs> as you can on a mobile system or a, a set top box system or on a computer. So the way to experience the game then would be through YouTube. And I'm wondering, is that going to actually lead to somebody not wanting to continue? Because there are slight mm. differences in the two properties. And if they say, oh, no, they weren't, you know, uh, uh, they they didn't take the source material and you use it at the same way or whatever. Like, okay, go play the game then. It, it, that's just my opinion. So, so but was, I'm wondering if that's going to lead to people not liking it. That was one of the things that Jonathan Nolan had brought up was the fact that they weren't going to be beholden to doing everything that was in the games. They wanted to tell a good story that was inspired by the games. So the real, uh, the real... 
I'm going to use air quotes, the real fanboys of the series kind of knew that coming in, that it wasn't going to be <laughs> a one-to-one -one adaptation. Now, wh why do I make that distinction? Because one of the other big video game properties, The Last of Us, they basically picked up the entire game from The Last of Us 1 and mm -hmm. adapted it to The Last of Us Season 1. Like, I hadn't played The Last of Us, the game, until after I watched the show. And as I've played the game, I'm like, oh, okay, okay. This is pretty much what I saw on screen, just represented slightly differently. That's not a bad thing. And I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that the Fallout television show has said, hey, we're going to be inspired. We're going to do a lot of the things they did in the games, but we're going to make it our own. And they did the same thing with Halo as well, for better or worse. I would argue in season two for better, in season one for worse, but that's just my opinion. You know, I also had not played the uh, Last of Us game and haven't yet because I was really interested because I would definitely watch the show, heard that the game, you know, saw all sorts of comments there about how amazing the game is and, and you know, how people liked uh, the show compared to the game. And, and, you know, I thought that was a pretty, pretty big nod to the writing of the game. And then I started to think, OK, well, if this is that accurate to it, if I go and play the game, is it going to spoil season two of Last of Us when it comes? Yes. So I kind of decided. Well, against Last it. of Us too will. Well, it, that's my question, right? It, 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 will they continue on that, you know, A to A version? So I kind of left off on that. So, you know, I think there's a bit of a back and forth that can happen if they do stay very faithful to the game or, you know, it can also maybe encourage both properties to, to live on their own if there's enough of a difference that you're not spoiling one with the other. I need to talk about this. Let's drop the entire series oh, or season yeah. all at once. I need to talk about it because I got burnt out on it through Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. when Netflix kept on doing that with the Defender series. Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Iron Fist, the Defenders. That all came out the same weekend. And I kind of, at the time, justified it as, okay, you're having Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. on once a week. So you have a competing once a week show out there if you did it once a week. So let's just drop it everything at once. But then you have people trying to consume it and you just can't. And then you get spoiled on everything because everybody wants to be the first to have their reactions out of watching the whole thing and everything. And there is this fandom boy in me that says, no, it's too much content. Just give it to me little bits by little bits. X-Men over on the Disney Plus right now is a good example where they could have just dropped everything, but they're not. They're doing it week by week, which I think is better for that series. But they've also done things lately on Disney Plus where they drop the entire thing at once. I don't like the let's drop everything at once because you can't experience it with somebody else. You, I know we're not on linear TV anymore. I know not everybody's watching it at 8 p.m. on Wednesdays, whatever time zone you're on. I know that's not the case anymore. But for crying out loud, don't drop all 12 episodes of something. So I have to spend the entire weekend glued to my screen, whatever screen that is, in order to get caught up on this stuff. There's life outside this show, people. I, I'm right anyway. there with you. I, I agree. I much prefer it fed uh you know, over a period because then you can talk with people. But I will say that um, I had a recent TikTok experience that in enlightened me on how some people just actually don't understand the concept of that anymore. And, and you know, I, I mentioned this on here a couple of shows ago that uh, I caught up. I, I binged The Rookie, the, the Rookie TV show, and then I booked uh, finished it just in time for the new season to come out. And so I found myself on rookie talk on a bunch of rookie clips on the, on the TikTok. And there is an, a huge amount of people when that show came back that are like legitimately are commenting like what you only brought one episode back. Like, like you only doing one episode and, and they just legitimately didn't understand the concept of a ongoing release schedule. And it, it wasn't just one person. It's on so many clips that have come up week after week. People just don't understand the idea of that. And I think that, it, you know, it makes sense because we are old and there has been a whole generation coming up with just binging. So um, I I think that get off my lawn and I'm right there yelling it. That's fair. If, I mean, I've also will fully admit I've gotten to the point now where I stopped caring about spoilers. I'm like, if I catch a spoiler on these things that just drop all at once, yeah. I, I don't okay, care. That's, 
fair. I'm way too over that hill myself. But if I'm a creator, I'm going to want to generate interest. Mm -hmm. And if it's a good series, yeah. having it week by week will do that. If it's a terrible series, you, that's what you're telling me when you're dumping it all at once. It's a terrible series. You're not going to be interested in it over time or your your attention will wane over time or whatever. That's what you're telling me. And it's like, okay, well, then I will watch it in the background as I'm doing other stuff because I don't need to be in as engaged because you're telling me it's not important to go week by week. Well, I'd love to know what everybody's thoughts are. Come to our Discord at gunnageek.com slash Discord because this is, I think, a very uh, polarizing topic that some people will be, feel very opinionated about. And I am right there with USB. I so want it fed to me. If someone wants to do some research and I can look at it after, what does Amazon binge mass drop or do week by week drops on? Like I know the boys, they, they do, do week by week lately. I don't know if there's any rhyme or reason mm. to them is more what I was trying to get at. I, I don't know. Interesting. All right, SP, tell me about yep. the fourth. The uh, may the fourth be with you. Well, that's, that we're not always. there yet. We're only in April, but sure. We, we could, we could talk about that if you want. <laughs> in all seriousness there is a outside possibility that spacex starship's fourth test flight might occur on may the 4th what now i, no I don't way. That, wow. that hasn't been announced or anything mid-may has always been the goal but if you take a look at stuff he likes to launch stuff on impactful days like 420 or the birthday of SpaceX or whatever. And we got one coming up. We got May the 4th and, you know, he wants to colonize other planets, do expanse style or Battlestar Galactica style fleets from planet to planet. So I'm just saying guys got a motif. So what are we talking about? We are talking about SpaceX's fourth test flight, which is upcoming at some point. They're getting ready. In the middle of getting ready for it, though, Elon dropped this update out of nowhere. I don't even know what day it was filmed. It was either filmed the night of April 4th or April 5th. I don't know. It was dropped on social media on April 6th. And it was Elon giving a town hall at the same stage that he's done before down at Boca Chica. There you go. Boca Chica, Boca Chica, Boca Chica for your drinking game there. Uh, so he's on the stage and he's showing stuff on the screen there. And he's just talking to everybody. And there were some key points to take out of it. Uh, it is on X. Uh, if you have a thing on X, I'm sorry. It's just where SpaceX is going to go because it's Elon owned and he's not going to give YouTube any uh, looks at all. He did put a sizzle reel on YouTube, but he didn't put the 45 minute talk over there. So his big thing, and he said this before, so it's not new news, but he's really driving this home that consciousness is rare and fleeting. He doesn't have any evidence of aliens. To be honest, I don't either, unless you want to call Steven an alien. And Th he's that's really... what somebody who knew about aliens would say. I have to call that out right now. Okay. <laughs> anyway, he's saying that the death of society of a one planet civilization is pretty high and he wants to prevent that. He wants to have a high priority to make life multiplanetary, which he can do within his lifespan. And there is an urgency to do this while society is strong, while the planet isn't wrecked and people can actually travel from planet to planet. He wants to preserve the light of consciousness, and the goal is to make society last for a million years by being a multiplanetary species. That's his goal. That's his stated goal. That is what he wants to do. So whether you think Elon is whacked out or not, he's this is his goal. He's got the money to do it, and he's building the capability to do it. So take that for what it is. Now, why does he want to go to Mars? Because you've heard this before. He wants to go to Mars. It's because Venus is superheated, high pressure acid ba bath. That's what he said. And I can't argue with him. It is. And unless Venus gets more hospitable towards the human being, Venus ain't it. The moon, there's some issues with the moon. There's no atmosphere on it. It's only a six gravity of Earth. It's missing some key resources there. And if you're talking about the survivability of the human species, if something happens to Earth, like it gets hit with a huge asteroid or another planet comes in and hits it or something like that, the odds are the moon is not going to really survive either. So he's saying there's questionable survivability with that's tied to Earth. 
and there's asteroids and and moons in the future and stuff like that so okay what is going on well there's starlink which is actually paying for stuff right now uh, people actually paying for starlink are paying for the continued development of starship and will continue to pay for elon spacex to go to mars and by the way starlink will be used on mars as well he said that he's going to put a bunch of starlink satellites in martian orbit to help everybody with their internet out there because well there's not going to be any fiber optic laid across the planet so all right he's making plans for that he thinks that there is going to be 20 years in order to make Mars self-sustaining, which would include every 26 months, there's this Holman transfer. If I had the graphics in front of me, I could show you exactly what that is. But basically every 26 months, Mars and Earth line up so that it's a low fuel transfer between Earth and Mars. And every 26 months, he wants thousands of ships to depart from Earth to Mars. Now, does it happen to have happen the same day? No. The window is somewhere between two and four months. And so you could launch a thousand ships in that 60 to 120 days. So he's talking about 10 launches a day, basically. And he wants to make a million people grow in whatever this society is on Mars over the 20 years, wants to send millions of tons of cargo out there. So we are talking about 10 launches per day. Each launch would be 200 plus tons to Leo, a total of 1.5 million tons of transfer per the Mars transfer. So this is the thousands of ships going over, which would lead to 250,000 tons to Mars. And it would take a total of eight years. So I, I wasn't sure if that was five transfers over the eight years or four transfers over the eight years. I would think it would be four, but I don't know. I haven't run those numbers. So that is what we're talking about. Now, what we've got going on is flight four is going to happen in a month or so. The last time we talked, we talked all about the great things that happened in flight three. Well, flight four is going to simulate the booster landing on a virtual tower out in the ocean. Now, they <gasps> tried that last time. My house? Yeah. My house? Maybe. Is your house near an ocean? It is then it's a possibility. Uh, yes! Here we go! Uh, <laughs> and if this is successful, if they're able to simulate that virtual landing, Flight 5 will then attempt to land on the tower. That's a big risk because, you know, if the booster smashes into the tower, then boom, and you have no more tower. And they do have the tower out in Florida, but they just... They tore down the actual mount part of the tower because they're going to, you know, make improvements on it. So uh, will it be ready by the time of Flight 5? I don't know. So anyway, that is exciting to see. Now, they want the ship to get through the... I, I qualify, ship. <laughs> okay, okay, thank <laughs> they you. They want the that ship... That way I don't have to edit it. Thank you. <laughs> they want the ship to get through the high heating regime and smash down that's the term that was used smash down into the water at least twice before they actually use it to launch anything and he says the odds of catching the booster not the ship but the booster on the tower he puts at 80 to 90 percent this year in 2024 that that is some high odds for coming from his mouth now we all know about elon time i'm not so sure about elon percents I, I have not seen any scientific breakdown of the percentages and Elon's gambling and stuff like that. So the ship needs to successfully fly twice before they attempt to land it at Boca Chica. He said that was really a safety factor and he didn't want to drop ship parts over Mexico and the United States as it was coming in for a landing. Okay, that's probably a wise thing to do since the other one kind of, you know, well exploded in orbit there over the Indian Ocean. So yeah, you don't want that happening. And then, uh, you know, parts maybe flying into Stephen's home. It, it, <laughs> you know, he's trying to prevent that, Stephen. Why? Why prevent it? I, it might be due to his ex-wife. Uh, fair enough. Okay. <laughs> okay. But he's targeting to mid to late 2025 for that. 
Also targeting in 2025 is a total of four launch towers, two in Florida, two at Boca Chica. It's not been stated where the second one in Florida is going to be. If I had to gamble, I would say it would be at Kennedy Space Center, but it might be somewhere else. I don't know. He wants to construct six more boosters and ships in 2024. He's got four already, four pairs. He wants to do six more. He needs more ships than boosters because as you go to the moon, you go to Mars, you're not going to need as many boosters as ships. And the first ships will be used as raw materials for the Mars base that we talked about. And they are going to have to ramp up production to multiple ships per day, over a thousand thousands per year. And uh, the next design thing will be the ship to ship propellant transfer that they want to demonstrate in 2025. The final Starship design is going to be over 500 feet tall. And as I mentioned before, be able to do 200 tons to orbit. Right now it can do, I want to say 50 in its next generation Starship 2. It'll do over 100 and then it'll do over 200. This is going to be a bit, literally the biggest flying object mankind has ever seen now. And it's going to get bigger. That's just amazing. And he is also going to be looking at the future offshore launch sites. At Boca Chica today, here is what's going on. They put a new booster quick disconnect or BQD shield or hood, if you want, on the system, plus a pipe. Apparently, they crimped some things the last couple of times and they needed to correct that. So they did. They put on a new chopstick actuator, at least on one of the chopsticks. I haven't heard if they did so on the second one. So I'm guessing they wanted to make it faster, better. You know, they they need to catch that booster. They did a six engine ship static fire on March 25th. They did a single engine starship static fire on March 27th. That was to simulate the booster, actually the engine firing in orbit to do the deorbit burn. So they had to do that. They did a 33 engine static fire of booster 11 on April 5th. They have put in more methane tanks and then put in methane tank concrete shielding. And they are working on a next generation of tile glue enhancements. They're worried about tiles falling off. There are some tiles that are mechanically fixed to the ship. And some we're talking about the re-entry tiles. And some tiles that are glued on. I think the speculation is some of the tiles came off after the last launch. Mm -hmm. I don't think it contributed to the ultimate failure because the thing was just twirling around. It It was rolling and pitching. And it was end over end. It was not a good site for ship coming in to the atmosphere at that point in time. But if it did, I think the tiles might have led to some uh, deficiencies. So they're working on that. This is all needed to get the ship through that high heating regime that Elon was talking about. And basically on stated was he expects there to be a few more failures with that before they're able to move on with the ship design and the ship landing at Boca Chica. But that's all that's happened since we podcasted the last time. I did listen to our episode the last time. I did make... I'm sorry. My apologies. I know. I know. It's the research that I have to do in order to get our listeners up-to-date information and be as comprehensive as I can. Again, the thing that surprised me was Elon getting up in front of everybody for 45 minutes and talking because, you know, that's never, you know, a good thing to let him uh, talk without a safety net. So, you know, I'll, I'll just throw it out happened. there. There's a robot division, right? Doesn't he have that? For those that don't know, I graduated from the United States Air Force Academy. What Elon was wearing during that speech, and he's worn it before, is somebody from the Air Force Academy gave him an A jacket. It's a blue jacket. It's a cadet uh, uniform that you wear, and it's in Colorado, so it gets kind of chilly. You end up wearing it quite a bit. He was wearing his USAFA or United States Air Force Academy provided a jacket during the speech. He really fancies himself a space cadet. Just saying. Well, thanks for updating us on that. And we look forward to you telling us more about the confirmation of aliens. I'll work on that for you, Stephen. (laughs) All right. Well, moving on to the next news point here. Um, Hey, Android, find my network. What? 
for those of you that didn't know this, uh, for a very long time, <laughs> uh, for the audio listener, Chris just had a bunch of fireworks come up on uh, behind him or on him. I'm, I'm very impressed. Yeah, I wish I knew how that happened. <laughs> I didn't do it, but I'm, I'm not sure. Did you do it? <laughs> no, I didn't do it. Oh, well, that's impressive. We learned something new here live on the official Going to Geek show. And I'm going to leave this all in because, you know, <laughs> We record through Video Ninja, and maybe somebody listening can tell us all about it. But we, uh, for those of you who didn't know this, uh, there is a very robust tracker system on the Apple side of things, the iPhone side of things particularly, for the um, the, the AirTags, uh, where if you have an AirTag, a lot of people think they're satellite-based because they're so reliable, but no, they're not. It's just all the iPhones are sitting there searching for these devices all the time. And so they're not actually satellite based. It's just you have to have an iPhone nearby and a lot of iPhones are nearby picking them up. 25 feet, folks, 25 feet. I there, There's a reason I know this. 25 okay. feet so, involves a dog <laughs> and the woods. And uh, yeah. We, OK, yeah. So 25 feet. But there's a, a, often an iPhone around within 25 feet or at least passing by at some point within a reasonable uh, amount of time. So that's been around for a while and, and credit to, you know, Apple where credit is due because obviously I'm a, a, an Apple fanboy now. Um, so you you have this robust network and there just hasn't been anything like that on Android um, other than, you know, patchworks of networks. So Tile had their network. Chipolo had theirs. Uh, there's another one out there. Samsung created one as well. And they often operated all in the same place, be, same way, because, you know, Apple AirTags came in after many of these already existed. So the thing is, though, all Android phones were not searching. It was very limited to people who had the specific app for the specific thing. I think the closest was probably Samsung's trackers because they did roll it into the software along the way where the Samsung trackers would be trying to pick up the Samsung smart tags. Unfortunately, the smart tags weren't that uh, around. There's a lot of people who did not get them because there's a lot of problems with them. So now Google has announced that they are fully re, uh, rolling out the revamped version of Android Find My Device, which will essentially work the same way as the Apple idea where the Android phones, where it is enabled, will be searching for the compatible Bluetooth signals that are emitted by these trackers. At launch, there's only going to be discovery for phone and tablets or through phone and tablets um, specialized in pixel hardware. So basically starting there and then they're holding, uh, planning to roll it out at a later date to the rest of the devices. And also they're planning to roll it out in May to Chipolo and Pebblebee so that you can use those with announced compatibility in the future for Motorola, Jio, and Eufy tags later this year. There has been no announcement yet about the Samsung ones, so I'm not sure about that. And the other thing as well is there will be some iPhone compatibility as well with this. So I'm not sure the extent of what that's going to be, but I know they are mentioning there's going to be some of that, which is actually, I think, partly because of the whole collaboration that Google and Apple did work for trying the, the privacy factor. A while so back, they got together to try to, to create a way that they could uh, make sure that users were alerted in a standardized manner if they were basically tagged with either one of these type of devices, things that are uh, Apple-based or non-Apple-based. So a point of clarification, the reason this got delayed so much is because Apple was slow to adopt and put that in place on their hardware that oh. was out already. That's why the Android one kept sliding right, because Apple had, and, and in Google had come to the agreement, but Apple had yet to implement it. So that delayed the launch of uh, the Find My Android network. You're such an Apple hater, Chris. No, no, no. I'm, <laughs> I mean, in comparison to you, perhaps, but... <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, I, I did read that, and I'm glad that uh, it's finally out. Yes, it did slide right, but in any case, I'm glad that we're working towards this sort of standardized approach to this because I think it is really important for privacy because, unfortunately, these tags have been really used for nefarious reasons, and if you tag something... Uh, like right now, an AirTag, if an AirTag goes on an, on an Android user, they only can know about it if they've installed the Apple app to alert them of that. And it doesn't even work as well as it should compared to like an Apple experience. There's just a way that it's configured that um, it, it's not as reliable. So 
I'm glad to see we're headed this way. And one of the things I thought was interesting with Google's approach is they are saying that there's going to be integration for the Nest smart home devices, basically to try to help track you down. So if you have things in your uh, house and they are near one of these compatible Nest smart devices, uh, it will help alert you to sort of where it's nearby to direct you a little bit. Because a lot of these tags don't have the... Um, uh, whatever the wideband thing is that will ultra wide, band. ultra wide band. Thank you. That will take you specifically and point you in the right direction. So, Hey, if you've got some of these in your house, it could at least tell you, look, look somewhere in your bedroom or whatever. So these are really interesting that they're coming now. Something to keep in mind is the first wave of pre-orders for both Chipolo and Pebblebee have sold out. So oh. you're talking, they originally gonna be like late May. The second wave is like mid to late June, it seems like. And there's been no announcement on when those other vendors are coming out. But when this was announced, I looked at a few things because Chipolo's done this before. They've partnered with a couple different wallet makers and stuff to put their hardware in them. I was curious to figure out which ones I would want. And there's a difference, at least in their hardware, in the fact that uh, Chipolo has a user replaceable button battery that you basically put in there that's good for nine to 12 months, I think it is, depending on the device. Whereas uh, Pebblebee has user rechargeable batteries associated with their devices. So as this rolls out, that's something for you to consider is, do you wanna just plug something in and charge it in roughly every nine to 12 months? Cause it's roughly the same timeline there depending on level of use. Or do you wanna pop open the content, the tracker itself and put a new button battery in. I can see it go both ways because your lithium ion battery is eventually going to wear out, but I don't know what the actual lifespan of these tags will be. And I'd be curious for anyone who's used Apple AirTags, how long they've seen their AirTags last for a perfect use case for SP here. Yeah, it depends on how often you ping it, but you're talking about every year, basically you want to put another battery in. And if you're using it more often, to find, then it's going to have to be even closer than that. So six to nine months, maybe, but it's uh, every year I'm planning on putting a new button battery in. It does make the button battery because you're opening it up and there's very little actual sealant in there. You you are introducing a, a water tightness issue. So if this drops in the water, your best bet for survival is to have it in a waterproof case, which sure. on the I, I've got one on both my kids' dogs, because if I ever have the dog and the dog gets away from me, mm. I I want to be able to yeah. find the dog. The dogs are chipped, but it's not a GPS locator. Yeah, and yes, it is only GPS. But as you mentioned before, there's enough iPhones around that you can locate, you know, where the dog was last seen and stuff like that. And I am fine with that but i worry about the waterproofness because especially with dogs they get out they're like oh look a pond i can go right. swimming and then you know the the tag goes away i will say for all of apple stuff in the modern generation the find my whatever is amazing because mm -hmm. even if it's in your house and it happens to be like under sheets or under blankets or under clothes that you're folding or whatever because sometimes you know you got your phone or your ipad out and you you know fold clothes over it and then you're like where the heck is my ipad and to be able to find it or maybe the case for your uh airpods to be able to find that using the compass and not just the sound is amazing, but you do have to be within 22, 25 feet, something like that. And if Android can implement something similar, it is going to make the lives of so many people so much easier. I am all for this. I'm not anti Android at all. You guys know that I do have Android or I have had Android stuff in the past. I just can't because of family reasons now, but the find my whatever and the compass is just amazing. Chris, do you have that capability now? I should because I have a Pixel 8 Pro so that'll have the ultra wideband stuff. I don't have anything that I'm using to track, but what I'm holding up on screen for those on video is my Pixel Buds Pro, the most recent ones. They'll get a software update that makes them trackable via the Find My Android network. Oh, cool. For instance, and there's a variety of other headphones. I believe a couple JBL and Sony pairs that they mentioned in the initial release that when the network rolls out will be trackable via the Find My network. Meaning if you lose your headphones, 
You don't have to have like an AirTag or an Android tracker taped to the back of it, assuming they're ones that are supported. They will natively work with the Find My Network, which I think is pretty cool. I'm I'm very excited for this because I'm not one that loses my keys and stuff, but this will make it a lot easier if I misplace my keys because I set them down somewhere. I want to toss one in my work bag. When I have to travel for work, I want to toss one in my work bag that I'm checking through so that I can see where it is and stuff like that. There's a lot of potential here. I don't know that I necessarily want one for my wallet because the only time my wallet leaves my pocket is when I'm at my house or when I'm at a hotel room that is locked and secured. So I'm less concerned there, but I'd be willing to consider it depending on what the size of the card based tags would be because I've kind of gone down to a very minimal wallet and my wallet does RFID blocking. So I'm not sure mm. how that would potentially, I, well, there's a pocket on the back that's not. So I guess I'd have to put it in the pocket on the back of my wallet. People have used them in cars. People have used them to tell the airlines where their lost yep. luggage yeah. is. I can personally say that I was in um, my car and then all of a sudden I got it pinged like you have an air tag that's been following you and I was like oh somebody's spying on me and it, and it turned out to be my daughter's keys that she had fallen and she it had an air tag on it and talking about that uh, you guys don't have kids well Chris you don't have kids at all but Stephen you don't have kids that are old enough to drive when they start getting old enough to drive and they have keys those keys <laughs> are amazing yeah. the spots that they can find themselves in and if you have some sort of tracker on it and I, I don't care if it's Android or Apple if you have some sort of way to track it your life will be so much easier and and maybe I'm not pointing any fingers I'm not but, you know, maybe there's a, a spouse that could benefit from this as well. I'm not, I'm not saying that for sure for you guys, but, you know, uh, I, the, the, the lost keys thing is, is huge to be able to find them. Yeah, I have had tile trackers over the years and I picked up the smart things or smart tag too because it has the ultra wide band. And I know exactly what you mean about being able to move around. It is it is a great thing to be able to point in that direction. But I might actually have to abandon it here for one of these other ones because I'd rather have my stuff on the Android Find My Network than the Samsung Network. So I uh, might, unless, you know, the Samsung ones get on board, might have to abandon them. Uh, let's move through our last couple of points here a little bit quick because I know, Chris, you were going to cater to SP's request to have more linear television. And so you petitioned Disney to try to implement something, right? So... I didn't do it, but this does kind of line up nicely with something that SP has been mentioning. Why I wanted to bring this story up as it's interesting is there was some news that came out from Bloomberg last week about the widely growing popularity in the United States, at least, of free ad-supported streaming television. The acronym for that is FAST, and I kind of enjoy that acronym, so I'm going to use it. So what's the circumstance here that was revealed? There was a Bloomberg story that found that the Fox-owned Tubi was getting better viewership numbers than Peacock, Max, and Paramount+. Plus. And for those that are unaware, Tubi is very similar to Pluto TV, in which it's an ad-supported streaming television platform where you basically have a variety of channels. You can hit the play button on, say, the um, Dog the Bounty Hunter channel or something like that, because I have seen that on Pluto TV. And it will then just stream that 24 seven with ads and things like that. I think Disney and some other folks, Amazon, we already know has learned that lesson, have looked at that and gone, hmm, we could do something similar. So Amazon, excuse me, Disney will reportedly be updating the revamped Disney Plus app to feature always on channels dedicated to things like Star Wars or Marvel shows, according to a report from the information. The channels, which are reportedly similar to those as the free ad-supported streaming service like Pluto or Tubi, will take away the choice when it comes to picking out what's to watch next. But more importantly, if you're someone who just likes to have background content on, background noise of programs you like, you go into the Disney Plus thing and be like, I want to watch the Marvel channel. And it could be streaming a variety of Marvel movies or Marvel TV shows. I'm sure there'll be a Marvel animation channel. I'm sure they'll do other channels that might be more catered towards kids. So for instance, the Bluey channel, because I believe that's on Disney Plus. I'm not 100% sure I don't have kids. But it looks like this is something that will be rolling into Disney Plus. Now, one of the caveats to keep in mind, this will not be a free tier of Disney Plus. You will still have to subscribe and presumably these streaming channel versions will still serve you apps. And it seems like even if you're on an ad free plan, you will still be getting, excuse me, commercials 
you'll be getting commercials on these, regardless whether you're on an ad-free plan or not. Wow, I, I botched that one. My apologies, guys. <laughs> so Talk. I get commercials. This is this is a great idea. So you'd have some form of channel you could turn into, and there would be right. commercials to support the channel. This is a mind-blowing new concept. I mean, it's exactly what Pluto and Tubi do. They're just putting it in their paid app, and they could also use a bunch of the same content they have on Hulu that they've now merged into it. So they could have a lot of interesting channels that you could just turn on for the day while you're doing stuff didn't and i'm just i'm just spitballing i'm just going by memory honestly i don't i don't i haven't looked anything up i don't know didn't 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 amazon just delete their fast no they still have freebie okay i thought i heard freebie was going away no someone put that story out there and amazon refuted it like the day later and we have no plans to shut down freebie okay well, I said I was probably misinformed, yeah. and I was. <laughs> no, no, you were informed correctly at one point. You just didn't catch the follow-up because I don't think the follow-up was broadcast as widely as the initial story that Amazon was considering shutting down Freebie. Mm. Uh, well, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, Freebie was gone. Yeah. Was no, I, I wasn't watching it. it because it was gone. But I do, I do, I, I'll admit, I do not only subscribe to Amazon Prime, but I do pay that god-awful three dollars and whatever cents a month to go ad free because oh, I, I don't i refuse to watch ads on that platform i, I will say and amazon's ads money. have been seemingly less egregious than other platforms like watching fallout there was ads at the beginning of the episode and that was it it wasn't like mm. there was a commercial break for ads i've, I've heard that but i i sense this is just a slow probably in, and then eventually they're gonna be like here you go now, I will say I have been rewatching old episodes of Wings on Amazon Prime Video <laughs> because I don't know why someone mentioned it. I was like, I vaguely remember this show and I'm only like six or seven episodes into season one, but they will do ads sometimes at the start of an episode or sometimes midway through when there was a commercial break on TV. So I've, I've seen ads in both circumstances, but it hasn't been any more than about a minute and 20 seconds worth of ads. Do you think that maybe we might get some form of way that, like, let's say they did this Star Wars thing that you mentioned, you know, channel dedicated to Star Wars. Maybe I'm really into Star Wars, but I'm not into these uh, classic movies, but maybe I'm into something more on Peacock. Maybe we could pay for a subscription that would, like, get me the, this channel from this provider, this channel from another, and just package it all together and just, you know... I could pay one fee for a bunch of different channels that are running ads all the time. So that, you can you can sort of do that with Apple TV, actually, is through Apple or Amazon does something similar. You can subscribe to other channels. So you could subscribe to the Paramount channel via either of those platforms and then have access to the entire catalog integrated into your Prime Video app or your Apple TV app. Maybe we could have like a tier system where it'd be like you could pay this tier for this amount of right. channels and this for another. Just all of this has happened before. All of this will happen again, right? <laughs> Go ahead, SV. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I think we're going to leave it there. At this, uh, yeah, yeah, cable TV is <laughs> rising from the ashes somehow. Yeah, I was going to say that Roku, you can get free stuff on Roku. You can get free stuff uh, on Samsung. You can sure. get free stuff in a lot of places. And I think that's good because if you get a smart device or a set-top box, one of the two, than like a smart screen, then you can have something to watch as long as you have an internet connection, but you gotta have the internet connection. And as we go for more 4K stuff, you're gonna, there's gonna be data caps possibly, there's gonna be caps on the, the, the actual uh, internet connection. So the real winners here is the internet providers. It's not, it's not the TVs, it's the internets. Yeah. You know who is a winner, though? All of those Whoa. people who got to see the eclipse last week. It was awesome. It's it true. was awesome. If you've never seen totality, getting to a place where there is totality is great. So I'm just going to explain what happened last week. So a week ago today on 8 April 2024, I had two minutes and 48 seconds of totality and about 3.08 p.m., uh, it was beautiful weather. It was low 70s. There was a hint of high altitude clouds, but it was pretty. Uh, the sky was just pretty open. I was granted work from home for the day, and that was mostly honestly to be uh, because traffic issues. There was projected to be a lot of traffic coming into our area and then leaving our area 
afterwards. So every school shut down, works were like work from home or they granted liberal leave or liberal vacation or whatever. And uh, it was also to guarantee the ability to watch it because if you get stuck in a building without any windows and you're just, you're just going to miss it. And it was a chance of a lifetime for a lot of people. It was total darkness. I don't know if you guys have seen uh, videos of what's happened to cities during totality, but there has been a few out there. And yes, it was it was completely I was kind of surprised because I have been it was been a long, long time ago. I've been in totality before and I forgot how dark it gets if you're in totality. It's not like you're on the edge or something. You're in totality. It got like midnight dark for a couple of minutes. You could see the planets, you could see stars. There was supposedly a comet that was visible. And honestly, it happened so fast that I didn't have a chance to look for the comet. And it cooled off immediately. It kind of started like a few seconds before, and then it just dropped like 10, 15 degrees. And we all knew it was only going to last for a little bit. But like a lot of people in our neighborhood were like, I, I need a sweater. I need a blanket or something like that. It got that cold and cooled off that uh, fast. So it's an amazing experience. I heartily recommend anybody who has the opportunity to be in totality in the future, to be in totality in the future. And in that light or darkness, this is a list of, for the audience here, your most likely next opportunities to be in totality. I've consolidated from a couple of sources. There is one that's going to be in Antarctica, February 17th. 2026. This will be in the summer in Antarctica. And I don't know if there's any dedicated cruises that are supposed to be going down there. But if there are, and you have a desire to go to Antarctica, February of 2026 would be the time to go. There is going to be one that crosses the European continent, mostly Spain, and then it goes up to Iceland. That will be August 12th, 2026. If you've never been to Spain in August, you you might want to think of going to Iceland versus Spain. And Iceland in August is actually a pretty nice trip to make. So that's August 12th, 2026. Northern Africa gets the next opportunity on August 2nd, 2027. And it really it skirts the entire northern continent, just the 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 shoreline of it on February or on August 2nd, 2027. And then our friends down under, and if Josh Liston, you're listening to this, you have two opportunities, and I do recommend that you travel to be in totality if you're not already in totality. The first one is July 22nd, 2028. I know that's winter down there, but that's a great opportunity. And the next one is November 25th, 2030. That'll be summer down there. Those two are great opportunities. One goes west to east, and I think the other goes north to south in November of 2030. Then I don't know if this will be close by you, Stephen, or maybe you can travel to it, but there are a couple opportunities coming up. One in Alaska on June 21st, 2039. And then one crosses Alaska and Canada on August 23rd, night or 2044. No, no, the the document says 1944. I assume that this means that there is confirmed time travel. I'm reading it right now. But Stephen's in hell. (laughs) He is now. I don't know where he's going to be in 2044. The next opportunity to be in totality in the United States, and I won't be in the path of totality. If I am alive on August 12th, 2045, I will be traveling to some place that will be within totality and I will want to experience that again. That's how good this is, that if I am alive in 21 years, I will be traveling to be in totality. On uh, February 5th, 2046, Stephen, it'll be at dusk, but I think you'll be close to it. You'll be closer to it than you will be in 2039. And then on June 11th, 2048, there is one that runs through the central U.S. and through the eastern parts of Canada at dawn. And then there is one that is slated to go through uh, the United States. So north of Vancouver goes down through West Virginia. Uh, Unfortunately, Chris, neither of us will be alive then because it's September 14th, 2099. I mean, I might be in an Android body by then. Yeah. Yeah. 
if We've, you're there, I know you'll be over a hundred years old. So find I, my Android. It'll be my body. Okay. <laughs> the, these are all well worth it. I, I sent you guys a couple of pictures over, you know, when it happened and, and what is so cool. It is a life transforming event. If you've never experienced it, I would recommend the next opportunity that you make plans to be in totality. Well, thanks for recapping all those because it did sound like it was pretty darn amazing. I know a few people who experienced it, including yourself. And um, y you guys, y'all just were making me jealous. So um, I'm very, very glad you got to experience that. And I hope in the future I get to experience it as well. In 2017, it was south of you, Stephen, but there was the eclipse that ran through the United States. It wasn't the same. I, I, I was at work and I looked out, but it was still very partial, which is uh, honestly, you, uh, you, I couldn't see anything until I put on the glasses. And it's like, oh, cool. There's a cutout out of the sun. And that was about it. Like there was no it, it was brighter than a cloudy day. Like, <laughs> right. People that have not experienced totality and have experienced an eclipse, that might be what their experience is. And I'm here to tell you, that is not the experience you get in totality. That is the experience you get before and after totality. That is not tot totality is where you want to be to an experience an eclipse. All right. Well, we will all reconvene in 2099. And I'm actually not going to talk about my last news point. I just put it on there to psych these guys out because I was going to talk about the Mac. But I will just say, uh, if you're interested, Spotify is maybe doing lossless. It's another rumor. But hey, that's it's all rumorville. That's going to take us to the end of another episode of the official Gunna Geek show. If you like geeky content, please do check out the Gunna Geek Network. There's lots of amazing geeky content over on GunnaGeek.com, which includes the Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. podcast, which is all about the Marvel Universe. There's also the All Things Good and Nerdy podcast, which has a lot of things that are nerdy and good. And you should check out both of those out at gunnageek.com. Lots of awesome content there. And come to our Discord as well at gunnageek.com slash Discord. Do either of you have anything in specific you'd like to plug about your respective shows? Chris? No, I mean, I think you, you nailed it. Uh, come check us out at some point in time. Right now we're streaming Thursdays, 8 p.m. Eastern. Aspie? The last... The last episode of Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. was probably the most impactful episode that we've ever had on legends of shield talking about the latest episode of x-men remember it it was so much that most of us could just watch it and then we had to sit and just absorb it and process it it was that i'm not going to spoil anything for it if you haven't seen x-men 97 you and you like marvel stuff go ahead and pick it up it means more if you've watched the X-Men, the animated series from the mid 90s. But if you haven't, at least start from the beginning of X-Men 97 and then you get to this episode and you'll see what we're talking about. It's on the level of Endgame. It's on mm. the level of Infinity War. And it's shocked me. It surprised me. I was like, whoa, we're getting this from this episode. And most people that have seen it say the same thing. I will say that the download numbers or the watch numbers on the episode from Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. are way up. And it's not because of us. It's because of the content that Marvel put out there for that X-Men 97 episode. The former showrunner said it's going to get darker. Mm. I could see that. I know, I'm sure I watched, watched the X-Men show but i just don't remember it can can i jump in yeah you're probably fine to jump in sp you you can probably i have not seen any of the recap videos that are out there on youtube but i'm sure you can watch a quick you know 10 15 minute recap video and catch the high points i was hoping you would have disagreeing opinions then i was going to make you battle until somebody i could decide with ready <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks, everybody, for coming and checking out the show, whether it's video or audio. We would love to have you in the Discord. So that's going to wrap it up for another episode of Gonna Geek Show. I'm Steven saying I feel so, so dirty today. I'm SP saying feel a little brighter. I'm Chris saying welcome to hell, Steven. <laughs> 
Welcome to hell. Bye, everybody. Do you want to build a snowman? <laughs> <laughs>